Professor Paul Mercis uh, has an architect training and he teaches in uh, the University of Delft, the University of Technology in the Faculty of Architecture, Urbanism and Building Sciences. He has this very interesting uh, expertise and job in advising public bodies as well as private developers on transformations in the existing cities. And uh, his lecture will be focused on a project he has been working on for several years, which is the enhancement of um, the so-called colonies of benevolence established across the Netherlands um, and Belgium and uh, with the final uh, objective to be inscribed in the UNESCO's World Heritage List. I suppose you would have a lot of slides, so uh, I refer to you there. Okay, thank you very much. My, my first uh, question is, uh, who has ever heard about the colonies of benevolence? One, two, three. Well, this is exactly one of the motifs to go into this process of denomination because we felt that it's a story uh, that should be known much better in the world. So, I mean, in a few years' time, more people will have known about the colonies of benevolence. Um, as an introduction, you said I, I'm teaching in Delft. Um, I was uh, chair of uh, uh, heritage, uh, uh, cultural value, heritage and cultural value for 10 years, but I left the position uh, last year to dedicate all my time for my research office. Uh, and after the discussion yesterday about the rural and the urban, I decided, well, maybe I should show uh, you my office because this is a typical example of uh, a very uh, rural setting in a very urban life. This is the one office, and the second office is in the middle of the center of Rotterdam next to the railway station, and in between is uh, 250 kilometers. Uh, and in this way, you serve the entire country with your, uh, with your office. The office uh, uh, consists of uh, architects and researchers, uh, architectural historians mainly. And what we try to do is to bridge the gap between the people who are planning and developing and designing and the people who are uh, writing and making heritage and producing narratives. So we are kind of interpreters between the world of the language and the world of space. And that's exactly one of the things in the uh, story I'm going to tell uh, now about the uh, nomination of the colonies. Um, if you look at the Dutch history, there's a very striking contrast between what happened in the 17th century, the era of expansion when Amsterdam was one of the major cities in the world, and what happened one century later when the country was in an economic decline, the cities were shrinking, and there were lots of social problems. Uh, on the right you see a, a notebook from the uh, orphanage in uh, Amsterdam uh, from 1797 uh, about all the children that they were sending to the countryside. So the cities could not handle the orphans anymore. They were sent to the countryside uh, to be adopted by families or to put to work in industries, and that was uh, a common practice in those days. Uh, it got even worse uh, in the years during and after the reign of Napoleon. Uh, like all over Europe, uh, there was a very big poverty, uh, a lack of uh, agricultural resources. Uh, people were, uh, were very hungry. Uh, there was a political chaos. And in Holland, uh, like 10% uh, of the people dependent on charity uh, for their uh, survival. So in those days, it's, which is about 100, 120 years before the time you are studying, in those days poverty was a big uh, discussion and a lot of people felt uh, uh, bothered about it because people were begging at the doors, uh, they didn't feel safe, there was this tension in the cities. So there were all kinds of initiatives, but we didn't have a strong state to, to take care of it. So uh, from society, initiatives were taken to deal something with poverty. And it's always a mixture of the good ambitions, the good intentions, and the thing of getting rid of the problem of the poor. And the story of the colonies of benevolence is always having a, 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 a positive side, but also a very grim and a very dark side. In 1818, which is three years after the restoration of the kingdom in the Netherlands, uh, the Benevolent Society was founded by this guy who worked at the ministry. Uh, it's a private uh, uh, organization, it still exists, um, but it was started by people who were working in the ministry. So by then the government was not that strong that it could uh, 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 take initiatives to, to deal with poverty. 
So people within the government and their connections built up a, a private thing, but in, in fact it was public-private. And the ambition for the uh, Benevolent Society was to uh, found chapters all through the Netherlands, which in those days also included Belgium up to 1830. And these chapters uh, had members, and every member had to pay five cents a week. And then by doing so, they were saving a lot of money. And in this crowdfunding manner, uh, if, a, uh, if a city had 1,600 guilders, they had the right to send one family for 16 years to a colony. So they, uh, in a way, they were, uh, it was very utopian, but you can also say it was deportation. Uh, and in a seven years' time, seven colonies were found at five locations, both in the north of Belgium and the north of, uh, of the Netherlands, uh, covering more or less 100 square kilometers. And the idea was to uh, solve uh, the problem of poverty uh, completely, eradicate poverty, um, by transforming the poor people into uh, farmers. And by doing so, the second objective was to uh, enlarge the agricultural production and in that way uh, 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 strengthen the, uh, the national economy. Uh, so by solving two problems at the same time, the, uh, uh, the vacant lands in the, in the country would be cultivated and the poor people would be uh, uh, emancipated and would return to society. Yeah, they were not deported to Australia like the English did, would come back to society as normal uh, people. This is the uh, prototype of, uh, of the colony. It's not about architectural value, as you can see, very simple forms. The idea was that a family from a city was living in this farm, uh, building the land around it, and uh, uh, part of the production, exactly like we saw yesterday in Spain, was for the company to pay back for all the things they, they had, uh, the, the loans for their, their costumes and their, uh, their food and their house, uh, and part would be for their own uh, uh, survival. Um, and of course the ground the, the, the was not so very fertile, so they never managed to pay back the, the things they, they, uh, they got from the, uh, the company. In many cases, the families were composed, which meant that if you had two children, you would get four orphans, and that would build up the family. So you can imagine, if you read the stories, there was a lot of tension, there was a lot of abuse, etc. And these colonist houses together would build up communities. The difference with what uh, we have seen uh, yesterday is that you all have villages and then the countryside around it. Here, the people were spread over the countryside, and there was also this idea that in order to normalize them, to discipline them, it would be better not to put them all together, but have a, a kind of a nice distance between them. And uh, after the first colony, the distance even got bigger because of uh, problems they had. Uh, and spread throughout these uh, colonies, there would be education, there would be supervision, there would be people for law and order, uh, uh, and there would be all sorts of things uh, to have a kind of autarkic life. So you must imagine these colonies as a kind of satellites way out in the countryside, a world on, on, on its own, uh, where everything was dealt with and organized by the, the company, which was really a big brother thing, uh, and in this way people would be disciplined to a normal life. After, uh, and here you have an example of some of the colonist houses which still exist. 400 of these houses were built and some 50 are, are, are left. After a few years, uh, they extended the formula and not only wanted to, uh, to deal with uh, families, but also with individuals like orphans, beggars, tramps, uh, uh, distorted people. So everything which was a problem in the city could be sold more or less to the, uh, to the colonies of uh, benevolence. Uh, and that was the business model they had. Uh, but they never managed to, uh, uh, to become profitable. So there was depth after depth after depth, and uh, whenever there was a new crisis, they, they found a new target group and they made a contract with the government, uh, hoping to get in some money, but it's like a Lehman Brothers. So in the end, it was a, a complete financial failure. So for these individual people, large institutions were made. These are buildings of 100 by 100 meters, uh, still in the countryside and still with the idea of uh, labor therapy. So there would be farms around it where the people would work uh, during the day and at night they would be brought back to this uh, central uh, institute. Four of them have been built in the Netherlands and uh, two in Belgium. And this one still exists. And afterwards they were transformed into ordinary prisons. This is uh, how life was uh, inside one of these uh, institutes with the hammocks and the whole system in a way that thousands of people could be uh, uh, 
housed in these uh, in the large uh, uh, complexes and uh, during the day the hammocks were on the on the ceiling so there would be a living space and everything was very packed very uh, massive and there was a wall inside so if you lived inside the institute you would never get out you would have the courtyard that would be your uh, outside space and if you would be in a better position you would be in the outside ring of the uh, uh, of the institute and you would have a little bit of contact there are many uh, stories about the terrible living conditions and all the social problems of, of the country were concentrated in these places, so it's really terrible. And here you have the image of, of such an institute and the farms around it where the people would work during the day. This was forced labor. Uh, these are called unfree colonies and the first one with the families, they are called the free colonies. But it didn't mean that people were free, but they, <laughs> they pretended to be free. It is an experiment, and uh, uh, um, if you look at, the, uh, uh, at, the, at, the, at this experiment from, from today's perspective, uh, you can only say that it was a big failure, because a lot of assumptions didn't come through. Uh, financially, it was a disaster. Socially, it was a disaster. Uh, it didn't change uh, the Netherlands. The poverty was not eliminated. But on the other hand, maybe that's too easy. And I think also in, in your colonies, the question is not if it's good or bad. It's our history. It's, it's something which is uh, a, a, a process in time. Uh, this was a kind of a wake-up call that poverty was a problem which had to be de dealt with by the government. It was a starting point. And from the bad experiences in the colonies, after all, later in the 19th century, the social uh, legislation was, uh, was produced. So criticizing this model helped to come up with better uh, alternatives and to uh, eventually solve the problem of, of poverty in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, another thing about the judgment is that um, these things do not stop at a certain moment. They still exist, like your colonies. Uh, uh, and if you say they're bad, huh, then it's like you want to get rid of them. But they are still there. People are still living there. They have their history. They stick to the names even of, of, of Franco, huh, as we have seen yesterday in the film. Um, but it can get maybe a, a new significance. It's, it's a place of transformation. If you look at the uh, evolution of, the, of the, the colonies of benevolence, a big step was already in 1830 when Belgium left our kingdom. So from 1830 onwards, the Belgium colonies went their own course. In 1859, there was the total collapse of the system, and the Dutch state took over the, uh, the unfree colonies, the big uh, institutes uh, which were in the Netherlands, keeping the small farmhouses uh, 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 for the Society of Benevolence. So the society still exists today and owns a lot of ground in these former free uh, colonies. So each and every of the colony, uh, uh, which you can see below, took its own trajectory. Some uh, uh, were transferred into, into a big domain, which is the, uh, the Society of Benevolence. Others became prisons, uh, uh, forensic institutes, uh, uh, things where, uh, where uh, uh, asylum seekers are, 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 are handled and, and so on, refugees. Um, but they all, one way or the other, kept certain of, uh, uh, values from the start and transformed them for other needs or for other user groups. And at the same time, the landscapes which were uh, designed and cultivated in the start still exist and still are extremely recognizable. So these are landscapes full of stories, a lot of bad stories, some good stories, maybe signs of hope, but mainly uh, they are uh, uh, reference points in our uh, uh, European history. Last January, the nomination was, uh, uh, <laughs> was brought to Paris. Uh, and because of all the maps which are in there, it is a very big dossier. We were extremely happy to finish this after five years of working. But the interesting thing is the process which went before that. Because the challenge, and maybe that is uh, uh, inspirational for the research you're going to do, the challenge was that we had the seven colonies which had 10 years in common and 190 years of uh, uh, individual development. But they all realized that if they wanted to become a world heritage, because they want to be recognized, because they, 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 they have, to have this ambition, maybe also for tourism and new economic activities, they had to invent a joint narrative. Because individually, they would never be able to, to get recognition as a world heritage. So for us, the thing was not to, to map the, the heritage, what we normally do, but was to, to write a narrative, to write the story which unites all these uh, colonies into one thing uh, up to the present day. Uh, or from, from today backwards, maybe, uh, and make that narrative in such a way that afterwards we could link it to the landscape, because uh, World Heritage is about physical things. 
So we started with a story, and then we had to try to w find a way to make the story visible in the landscape. And the landscape in, uh, in an agricultural colony is a lot of grass. So we had to link the grass to the story. And then, because of the World Heritage List, that had to be of outstanding universal value. Uh, this is this OUV, it's a kind of mantra which is in all the, all the minds of people who deal with World Heritage. We had to prove that this narrative and the way it was reflected in the, or visible in the landscape would be of outstanding universal value and that it was authentic and it had integrity and all the things that you have to prove in a nomination dossier. So we embarked in, uh, well, some years ago on this whole process of writing the story, inventing an OUV, trying to visualize it in the landscape, define the boundaries, define the attributes, uh, the, the elements which, uh, which you can see in the landscape, uh, uh, work on the management and all those things together with two countries, four provinces, uh, uh, 11 municipalities, and thousands of, of people. So this community and participation was a kind of a constant thing because these nominations, they have a big impact on villages and you cannot just have this as a kind of a hobby for some uh, politicians and some uh, specialists. It has to have uh, 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 approval from, uh, from the communities. So all through this process, we, we, we exchanged uh, information. It was a lot of information. And, and, and the interesting thing which happened, and, and that again could be interesting for a case like we saw yesterday in Spain, is that at the beginning, these, these are uncom it's an uncomfortable heritage. Yeah? It's, it's, uh, uh, it has a bad side, a bad connotation. So in the beginning, there's a kind of a taboo. You do not even dare, dare to say you come from this place when you're outside. This was the case in our colonies. But as it becomes history, people, they are very happy if they get a recognition because they, the, the pain they had or their grandparents had or all the suffering, uh, you can say it was worthless, but you can also say it is being recognized as something which is, is a phase we had to face in our history. I think also the, 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 how, you, how we deal with the wars from the past, it's, it depends on how you uh, process this and, and how you give it a place that you can also uh, create new perspective. So this recognition we, we noticed is extremely important in the colonies and as soon as people feel that they are treated seriously for the first time perhaps, uh, then they come up with all the stories and they want to tell their, their uh, testimonies, they want to tell their stories. And uh, from all the colonies we have, uh, 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 we have books now, liter literature, Dutch literature, about the life in the colonies, some researchers, some by uh, people descending from colonists, uh, which is seen as something, uh, a, a very uh, unique story, and people want to share that. And the, and the third step in this participation, after this thing that you start listening to each other, you, you get rid of the taboo, uh, you recognize uh, the, 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 the case, is that it is being transformed into proud. People are extremely proud of uh, the fact that they are living in a colony, so this bad connotation is completely substituted, and they have to be. Uh, they, they became kind of the spokesman of what happened in the 19th century in the uh, in the Netherlands, and that's maybe one of the, the best uh, products. Uh, independent if we get this nomination uh, done or not with UNESCO, this process of emancipation of, of the uh, uh, of the region, uh, recognizing the story and telling that inside Holland but also uh, outside, that is uh, uh, a very positive thing, and which I can imagine could be one of the goals in your research is also it's not to make a, a, an evaluation or a judgment but is to inform about what happened and reflect upon that and learn from that and give it a place in history so when we started we made a big tour through all the colonies and we saw a lot of grass and we saw a lot of landscapes and so well this is what we have to sell to uh, to ICOMOS and to UNESCO um, now I know that if you know the story, you can see uh, a path, and it is the path where every day the, 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 the colonists had to walk from the uh, Central Institute to the lands. So in this landscape, uh, very subtly uh, hidden, you find references to uh, this whole system of the, uh, the way the colonies of benevolence were working. But of course, there's also lots of uh, buildings left over from the uh, benevolent society like the head office, where still is the, uh, the uh, colony, uh, asylums, lots of churches, the cemeteries, which are really the most impressive uh, areas where thousands of colonists were buried. Um, you may even find the two Jewish cemeteries, and you find lots of things which, which uh, could be components of the stories we want to tell, or which could be the attributes which help to, make, to visualize what is uh, happening there. 
you find some of the original farms, like on the, on the bottom, uh, all uh, built by the uh, society. And you will find lots of things which were built by the Belgian state and the Dutch state after the uh, areas got nationalized. And then you get the large prisons, the very monumental prisons in Belgium and the ones in, uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands. So from, from this idea of constructing a narrative and visualizing that in the landscape, we came to uh, our nomination. Uh, I don't want to give you all the details of the nomination, but just the things that we thought is interesting of the thing, because UNESCO has this operational guidelines. I don't know if you know anything about the system. It's, uh, you can download that from the internet, which is a kind of handbook on how to make a, a nomination, and it's very directive, and everything is very well constructed. So in the beginning, we were kind of allergic to these guidelines because you want to make your own story and then you're forced uh, by the guidelines in the format. But afterwards, it proved uh, uh, very productive for us because it helped us really to get to focus in, uh, in our research and, and get to some result and, and get it into the format. And one of the main things in, in a nomination is that you have to prove its uniqueness for the world. And uh, uh, there's a list of 10 uh, reasons why something can be unique, uh, which are the 10 criteria. So the criteria are fixed, and you have to choose them and, and make clear why your nomination <coughs> fits to that criterion. Criterion one is a masterpiece of human genius. Uh, that's the Opera of Sydney, for instance. And nobody can ever imagine uh, such uh, an opera to be like that, but only a, a genius or... Uh, or, or, or um, we, of course, didn't think about the human uh, genius because that's not at, <laughs> at all the case in the, in the colonies. But we choose uh, three ca categories, uh, uh, three criteria, the number three, the number five, and the number six. And I just want to show them how we build up our argument. Uh, three is about uh, the, 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 the tradition uh, of mankind and how that is manifest in, in a place. So we said, this is a place where the tradition of social engineering this idea of uh, the enlightenment of changing uh, people uh, uh, is very visible and, and it's a very early example of uh, the effort by a state to uh, eliminate the poverty through a system of agricultural settlements. So this whole social uh, system, the disciplination, all those things which are linked to that we covered in the criterion uh, number three. And then you can uh, talk a lot about the disciplination and it's uh, the interesting thing, it's about the conditioned life here with the bell every morning and everything was very much scheduled, but also the landscape was very uh, uh, conditioned. So this landscape was already designed to make people uh, uh, well, at ease, I don't know, but to make them uh, uh, part of this uh, uh, disciplined uh, system. There was no escape, it was far from all the cities. People were dressed in uniforms. We even found uh, examples of the, of the cloths of the, of the uniform in the archive. It was a world in its own. It had its own currency, so you could only spend your money in the, sh in the shop. And uh, alcohol was forbidden, so there was a lot of uh, illegal uh, thing. And all around there were all these uh, slogans about uh, pray and work and uh, <laughs> uh, all these moral uh, inscriptions. So it is really a landscape of morality, disciplinization, uh, uh, everything very predictable. Second, it is also a, a, a landscape of, uh, of faith and hope. Uh, it's one of the uh, first places in the Netherlands where uh, education was obligatory for children, uh, I think 60 years be before it was in the rest of the country. People got a lot of opportunities for training, uh, uh, to learn in, in, in the labor, and especially in the beginning, uh, this was a very good thing. So they were really trying to stimulate people in a positive way. Later on, as they were dealing with thousands of people in this very big institute, you can understand that this training and ed education uh, was not always the biggest priority. And, but the children always went, uh, went to school. The picture is a, a reenactment showing that the local population is reliving this whole story every year. And the third uh, uh, is the moral education. Uh, if you want to, uh, to create normal people, they need a compass, they need a, a morality, uh, because then you can function in a city as a normal uh, uh, person. And education, uh, uh, relig religious education was very important for it. And there's a famous saying that it didn't ma matter what your faith was as long as you believed something. 
So you could choose to be a Catholic, a Protestant, or a Jew. Uh, you had all these uh, categories, and if you were nothing, then you had to choose. And then most people choose to be Catholic because that you had more holidays. <laughs> So in, in the colonies you find always uh, 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 Catholic and Protestant churches uh, and there were uh, Jewish communities and there was a, a synagogue and, and uh, they think, want to ask a question? No, no, no. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, so you see this thing and there's a big difference with, uh, with religious institutions. This was not to add, uh, uh, an effort to bring people in the church. This was nothing like that. This was really like a modern society where all the faiths were represented. So these are all the stories you want to cover with this criterion number three. And then five is about the cultural landscape. So that's really about the cultivation of, of nature in order to make a new landscape, uh, a productive landscape, and, and uh, get to this agricultural uh, production. Again, this is being re-enacted every year. What, what I like very much about the series of seven colonies that they are all orthogonal uh, uh, projections over the natural landscape, but they're all very different. So it's not a blueprint, but it's a logic of thinking which is uh, uh, embedded in different landscapes. So some landscapes are uh, with peat, some are with, uh, uh, on, on sandy grounds. Uh, they all were not so very productive. Uh, the, the, the quality of the ground uh, was, was not very high. So there's always a, a, a system to organize the uh, agricultural space, but also to organize uh, irrigation, uh, water drainage, uh, water supply. Uh, and then the, the system uh, dis distributes with the, the, uh, with the estates, the institutes, uh, uh, farmland, woodland, all these things, but very organized. So from the air still today, you can clearly see the colonies, especially in Belgium, because there's very different from the occupation around the colonies. It's an island of, uh, of an organized uh, settlement. And then there are the two typologies, the free and the unfree colonies. Uh, and that's really a kind of a landscape typology we only see in, in the colonies of benevolence. Uh, of course, in line with the tradition of, of land reclamation of the Netherlands uh, from the Middle Ages onwards. In the, uh, in the free colonies, you see all the little houses of the, uh, the families, but also central services, uh, uh, schools, uh, all these things uh, together. So it's a, it's a village spread over a larger uh, area. It's, it's a, an early example of a rural sprawl, I would say. And then the typology of the uh, unfree colonies is always with a central institute which you can see here, and in the middle there in, in Belgium, and then a whole series of farms uh, and agricultural land around it, and then there's a contrast between the concentration of facilities around the institute and the countryside around it, where you just have the farms, uh, and the connections that uh, the colonists would go to the farms every day. After all, uh, some crafts were added to it because some of the people were absolutely incapable of doing the work at the land and they were also unwilling to do it. So there's a lots of remarks in the archives about the low productivity of the colonists and, and all the problems that there were to get them to work. But this whole model of the organization you can still recognize in the landscape, if at least you know the story. And then there's a thing which, uh, um, which might also be the case in, in your colonies or in, or in your settlements, that is the efforts to make not only, to, not only to, uh, uh, to cultivate the land, but also to improve the, uh, the production. There was a lot of academic thinking on, on agriculture in the colonies. So from all kinds of sources, they tried to find out how to make the soil more productive, more fertile, how to, by uh, uh, diversification of the crops, or, or by uh, uh, leaving some areas uh, unused for a year and then use it for three years, all these things were experimented in the colonies. They were very well documented. Uh, so we have a huge record of a kind of almost scientific uh, experiments. There's very little result in practice because the area was really uh, in a very bad uh, condition. But the system of learning by, uh, uh, by experiment uh, is, is very, uh, very present. There were even the first agricultural schools in the Netherlands were founded in the colonies in 1823. Here you see two examples of allotment. One is from, uh, from Fredriksort, which is the first colony, and then in, in the uh, third or the fourth colony in Belgium, 
uh, examples from the from the Netherlands were sent there, and they improved it and thought about with the comments and the ex experience of, of the, the Dutch colonies, make a better version in the uh, Belgian colony. And this is how to organize the land. And the idea was that the, uh, the, the colonists would have uh, uh, four areas of land, which we call a morning, which is the area you can cultivate, which you can dig in a morning by one man. So that was the measure of the, of the areas. Later on, it was uh, larger because of the, 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 the crop and the, and the output of the land. And the last uh, criteria of UNESCO, uh, which we adopted, is the associative value, criteria six. It's a difficult thing because it's about uh, uh, stories uh, and it's always difficult to prove where you can find it. But we feel this is very much uh, a landscape which is a, a, a testimony of something uh, in your mind. Uh, and in there, uh, uh, a very important thing is the social ini initiatives of the Dutch elites, with all this membership, this organization, where uh, at a certain moment, 2% of the uh, Dutch population was a member of the society and was paying uh, for the uh, thing. That's a very early example of crowdfunding. Uh, uh, and, it, and it is one of the initiatives which forced the, go the, the, the state government into the direction of, of recognizing the, that the social issues were a duty of a government, a public duty. It became also a reference uh, throughout the world. Uh, in the beginning there were lots of Germans and French people visiting the colonies. Uh, and and uh, writing extremely, uh, uh, posi uh, posi I say in a positive manner about them. Later on, uh, uh, there were even more visitors, and many of them were very, uh, very critical. Uh, but we can see, we could trace in the literature that both the positive but also the critical commands were used in the uh, foundation of later colonies in Belgium and, and uh, uh, Germany and France and in other countries. So it was really a kind of a, a network, a system, it was a big exchange of ideas. Uh, a lot of people were also associates uh, uh, to the uh, colonies of benevolence from, from different countries around it, uh, Pestalozzi and Owen, and they all were tied in the system. Uh, and this is one of the very early examples where the experiment was uh, done at the, at the scale of a, of a state. But also this associative value is that uh, uh, the colonies now have become a place of collective memory in the, in the Netherlands and in Belgium. Uh, but also a place of reflection, because we still have problems with poverty. We still have things about uh, segregation, about refugees, and all of these things. And in a way, these colonies could be uh, a, a place of reflection and thinking about what we can learn from the, uh, the experiments in the 19th century. In one of the uh, institutes, there's the National Prison Museum, where the, the Ministry of Justice explains how the system works, shows the history of, uh, of the Dutch prisons, uh, how much it costs, what is the regime, and a lot of things. And it's, it's uh, extremely uh, well visited. We have these reenactments, of which you have seen at different uh, pictures, where the people, the local people themselves, dress up as colonists and receive a lot of tourists. But we are also having this opera in uh, Veenhuizen, uh, which is a, a very high-end uh, opera production, uh, the, uh, the poor opera, the, 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 the pauper opera, uh, which is sold out, or was sold out every, every summer night last year and will be repeated uh, this year, where really uh, the masses in the Netherlands go and see, and they travel for hours, two hours, to, to get there. The, the dossier is online, so if you're interested, I can give you a link. Uh, and you can have a look at all the books we produced uh, with a big team. Um, just one more thing, uh, the comparative analysis. And this is, I think, interesting for you to look at what happened afterwards, because it's the ideas. Where do ideas come from and how do they travel? So the Society of Benevolence is in the middle, so it's a little bit parallel with the conflict sites in England, which are partly different and partly have similarities. But many uh, 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 foundations afterwards one way or the other, they have a, a relation or people uh, uh, knew about the colonies and so on. So you can see all these uh, uh, initiatives. And in this way, we want to prove that the, the colonies of benevolence were not the solution, but they were a starting point of, of uh, the, uh, how say, the uh, modern uh, society in the welfare state in, in Europe. Uh, and maybe that through the disaster of these <laughs> colonies, uh, uh, others uh, advanced and improved afterwards. And this goes uh, all the way to the present day. 
So now we have the, uh, the seven colonies on five different locations uh, in the process. And hopefully next summer at the uh, World Heritage Committee meeting there will be a decision and this will be exactly the year that the colonies exist for 200 years. So everybody is very anxious. But for us the work is done and we've already forgotten this thing and we're going to other things. To finish my story, I want to show you some things just about the techniques we have used for the mapping of the colonies. Uh, and maybe there could be uh, some input for your methodology, I think. Oh, one last, last thing about the nomination. There was a huge bus with uh, the, the emblem of World Heritage went to Paris with all the mayors and eldermen and they, they made a kind of estafette through all the colonies and then went to Paris. About mapping, what we did a lot was the superposition of maps. It's a very easy uh, technique, but extremely uh, powerful to see what is still there, what has changed, and we used it to, uh, to prove the integrity of the, of the colonies. Uh, here we have the 1831st cadastral map uh, uh, and today's map, and you can see that this uh, pattern uh, was already there in uh, 1830. Uh, then we have the 1905 map, and we have today's map. So we could easily show what are the locations of the farms, and then in red we indicate the farms which are still there from the beginning. There are only two farms in this colony uh, which date back to the years of the uh, society. But all the others, the, the locations are still there, so in the structure of the landscapes, the farms are still recognizable. And you can discuss about the other farms which were constructed in between later, but the, the whole uh, thing is uh, still visual. So the superposition, and then the next step is to put it all in uh, GIS and link it to other data. Uh, is still there. Another thing we did was we wanted to show the uh, evolution of the landscape. So for all the colonies we choose a, a, a typical section and try to make a reconstruction how it was in, uh, in, uh, in the phase of uh, construction, uh, the natural landscape, in the initial phase of the colony, in the uh, second phase which normally was when the state took over and in today's landscape. So you can see how the landscape evolved, and we can prove also with botanic research that certain uh, trees uh, were already there 200 years ago. And with the tools of today, this is a very powerful thing also to uh, get people engaged, because you can show them their landscape they know, and from there you can show how it was 100 years ago, or how it was 200 years ago. Uh, another thing we had to do to get to the attributes is very detailed mapping. So if you uh, map an area, if you map such a colony, like this is the Wartel colony in Belgium, you can ex uh, very precisely indicate all the buildings from the uh, thing, and we have seen already some examples yesterday, uh, in, in particular of the central squares in the, in, the, uh, in the settlement, where you can see which are the original houses and which have changed. If you just map that very precisely on the whole region, you immediately get the picture. You can see uh, uh, how it was, how it is today, and what was added and what was changed. Uh, and it's not about only about the buildings, but it's also about the waterways, the roads, uh, uh, forests, and, and so on. But these maps, they really hide a lot of information. Then we, and I think also, well, we've seen in, in Spain all this paperwork, uh, all the sources there are about the individuals, the colonists, the people who went there. We have dossiers about, uh, we've forgotten everything about normal people in the early 19th century, but we know everything about the people who were sent to the colonies. Uh, when they misbehaved and when they, whatever they did, it's, it's all in the, in, the, in the archives. Maybe a little bit like uh, Estonia <laughs> and the Russians. It's so difficult to use these things because it's so much. But at the same time, it's such a powerful resource to bring back the individual in this massive state uh, organization. So uh, instead of knowing everything of everybody, if you just know a, certain, a few people and you can tell what happened to them, they can be the ambassadors of all the other people who remain silent. Um, we have a lot of volunteers in the, uh, in the, in the colonies, and uh, uh, mainly the elder people who love to be in the archive. And they have linked all the individuals to the, the, the geodata. So now we have maps, and you can uh, uh, indicate them, and you can see who has lived at this place. Or if you have a name, uh, like I put in my family name, and I can immediately see where people with my name were uh, living and when and what they do. So these are the uh, archive uh, tables in, uh, in Drenthe in the archive. This is for the free colonies. So with your finger on the right top, you can point on the map and then you can zoom in into uh, what kind of people live there and you can uh, uh, get all the documentation and, and, uh, about the people. 
So here we link the, the individual stories with the landscape. And a lot of people come and they're extremely interested. Huh? That's also part of this recognition and pride that everybody's very curious to know. And in the beginning, if you would have a grandfather, which was a little bit awkward, so you, you would uh, ignore it. And now you're extremely proud on, 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 on television to tell about these this strange uh, relatives of yours and how they misbehaved in the, uh, in the society. When you get to conclusions, and all our colonies, they all have a very different trajectory, like your colonies have. Um, by mapping them in a matrix and trying to say what is the distinguishing quality in terms of landscape, in terms of typology, in terms of evolution, in terms of whatever you put in. But these matrices, they are extremely helpful to organize your thing and, and make comparisons, not by saying you're comparing apples with spears or oranges, but by just systematically organizing the data so you can know what are the uh, uh, similarities and what are the differences between the different uh, uh, settlements. So again, it's not to, uh, to suddenly say that they are family, but you can say where, in, uh, if, if it's in the functional or the physical or in, in whatever tissue it is, that they, uh, uh, they have similarities or, or differences. <coughs> and then uh, eventually some slides about uh, the management of the areas and, and how we try to keep this as a heritage thing. They are very large landscapes. They are living landscapes. A part is still an uh, agricultural thing. And, when it's about participation, there's the participation with the people in the village. And that is always, well, you have to, uh, to trust each other and then it's a very positive dialogue you have. But the communication with farmers in Holland is a different thing because farmers, they are allergic to government. They are allergic to anybody who wants to imply rules upon them. I, mean, I can imagine that it's like that in the whole world. So this idea of making world heritage, and you say, well, nothing will change. So you can keep on being here, you can extend your farm, and maybe some, some regulation, they say no. Because you say that, but next what you will do is uh, you will tell us what to do and we have to receive tourists. And so they are absolutely against it. So in one of the colonies, we really had to eliminate the buffer zone because there was no, uh, no support from the farmers and they had a very strong lobby. So that was really a clash. And at the same time, they are curious. So little by little, maybe in, in a few years' time, they will get used to the idea of being heritage and then uh, join up. And some of them, they, they like it very much, and they, they extend their, uh, their business model uh, with uh, cultural tourism. And, and uh, you can buy products uh, at their farm, and they, they reenact, and they, they guide people through the landscape, because at the same time, they're proud of the place. So it's a, 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 a difficult dialogue. This is uh, one of the colonies, the one I also showed in the, uh, in the evolutional uh, diagrams, where there's a kind of hierarchic system of uh, preservation. Uh, where there is the, uh, the big institute and all the main uh, uh, attributes are found, uh, it is the, the red zone, which is like a conservation area, uh, like an uh, uh, urban, urban heritage zone. When it's still the core property of UNESCO, but it's only about the structure of the landscape, uh, it's, it is uh, uh, conserved by the, uh, by the urban plan. And we can add heritage value to our urban planning in, uh, in the Netherlands. So you don't have to give it a special declaration or denomination as urban heritage. You can just put that in the regulations. And in the buffer zone, we just recognize this as a buffer zone uh, and all the present uh, uh, regulations, they, they are in place. And only in the future when there might be a discussion about wind turbines or anything which will really change the landscape dramatically, then there will be a discussion. But in UNESCO, there will always be a discussion, and no matter if it's inside the buffer zone or outside the buffer zone. But in this way, we could sell this idea of world heritage of a landscape to the local uh, uh, municipalities. <coughs> and a lot of European money has been invested, in particular in Belgium, in the uh, restoration of the farmhouses. Uh, at the Merxplatz uh, prison, there will be a big visitor center and a lot of new initiatives. So this nomination process is also kind of a generator to tell the story and there's a kind of effort and that's a little bit difficult to get all the colonies together in their communication and they want to say it's one history and five stories uh, uh, so, so that, that everybody has the freedom to make their own story but still there's the umbrella of the uh, of the colonies and also in the museums in Holland and Belgium a part of the concepts they share and they specialize on different things so there's a lot of exchange between them which all started because of the nomination process Be before we didn't know anything about the, the colonies in Belgium well there can be a debate this is still one of the initiatives of the Society of Benevolence today 
they start, they always need money. Yeah, they, for 200 years they've been begging for money. And they have the, 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 the land. There are 50 houses left, uh, but there were 400 houses. So they redesigned a modern colonist house. Uh, and they say it's a zero emission thing, so that's in line with today's, uh, the, the, today's interpretation of the, uh, of the key uh, values. And it's a big success. They sold a lot of them. But now our colonies are, <laughs> are completely stuffed with these zero, zero emission homes full of uh, so solar panels and everything. And I, I keep my fingers crossed for when ICOMOS is coming. Uh, and we'll talk about authenticity, because is this a, a, a continuation or is this a, a cheap replica? You can also say, well, it doesn't matter because it's about the landscape and in the landscape structure, if you have uh, the, the buildings, the modern buildings, it helps to understand the authentic landscape. But anyway, uh, there's always a lot of discussion. But the big challenge for us is to, to really give the, uh, the, the core value of what the society was uh, uh, founded for. Uh, the, uh, the social improvement, the elimination of poverty, uh, uh, the well-being of, of the population that should be addressed in new products uh, in care or in social initiatives or in places of reflection and uh, uh, as the prisons are slowly leaving the area we have a lot of things to recycle to reuse and cultural tourism on its own is not enough we need really uh, uh, new initiatives which fit to it and that can really help to give a new life cycle in which the, the colonies will uh, uh, stay different uh, in, their, in their use than the uh, countryside around it. Um, but that's a very difficult process because the local communities, uh, um, they step in this debate at a, at a different level than, than people who come from outside. But little by little we hope that uh, maybe the colonies might become a center of reflection or a, a center of care for the elderly or all the things that our society today is desperately uh, needing. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for the very impressive um, uh, show, showing of the project. Um, I would like to know how many people were involved in all these mapping processes and also building up the, um, the exhibition and other things. And well, yeah, just how many manpower was involved in that? Yeah, well, the, the colophon is very large because it involves all the, uh, all the mayors and all the eldermen and all the politicians and all the uh, civil servants from all the municipalities. And they all worked and they all gave it their share. But the, uh, uh, the central part, um, of the dossier was, was prepared by a, a Belgian office, Carvan Serra, one person, and my office, and we had four or five people working on the dossier. And we did the whole basic research. In the end, all the maps were uh, put in GIS by the province of Drenthe, and then there were two people working there. Um, so it was not that many. So the, the, the research, uh, which is the justification, the history, the <coughs> description, uh, was it, well, uh, maybe four years of work? if you spread it all over our companies. But then the management plan was done by another office, which is another year of work. And the whole process, that is the work. So it's not so much of, of producing the dossier, but it's producing this uh, uh, approval by, uh, by the municipalities and by the people. That was the big work. So at the province, the, the process people, uh, uh, that was a larger team. Uh, four per people were constantly working on the, on the colonies always together with people in the different municipalities who also did a lot of work. So it's uh, a lot of, thing of, of the work is, is very much invisible, but where it comes together, I mean, if you, just, if you don't have too, too many meetings, you can, you can really produce. I have a question out of curiosity and a comment. The question is about uh, the evolution over time. I mean, what happened to the kids? I'm just curious to know, I mean, they were received when they were young and then what was their future and how far their future was uh, into the colony system or instead it was uh, but then I just uh, I, um, I, there is also a comment and I'm, I was trying to bridge the two presentation and I was thinking that uh, there is another dimension into this concept of lens landscape which is a sort of projection of projects if you want but the thing is it is something which is not uh, is there but you need to know things in order to be able to see it so this is I think this pretty much what our job from now on is going to be. Yeah, about the children, it depends a little bit if there were children in the free or the unfree colonies and in which era it happened. 
uh, in the beginning, a lot of children from the free colonies, they really managed to, uh, uh, to get positions, like they would become the farmers in the farms of the unfree colonies, or they would get uh, uh, jobs as, as uh, employees in the unfree colonies. So you could make a career uh, within the, uh, uh, the, the colonies of, of benevolence. But many children, they, uh, they didn't have the perspective, and although they were going to school, they never managed to get out of the colonies. They stayed in there, or, or they left and came back. And, uh, uh, so there's, there's lots of stories about uh, people who never really managed to, uh, to, to get a position in society. Uh, yeah, then about these narratives, I, I, I fully agree. Yeah? The, the, if, if there's a monument, an old monument, like Italy, yeah, it's full of old monuments, and there the, the tangible is very impressive and uh, is telling a story to a lot of people. And the specialist can add and can maybe guide the eye and, and can add information and data and put it in place in, in, in history. But the experience is already there. Um, if we take people to, to the colonies, they immediately run away. They think it's boring. and they, uh, 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 So we really have to open their eyes and we have to say, well, wait a bit, let me tell you something. And uh, so we really need the guides or we need the apps or the whatever we, uh, you can have to make clear that it looks very common, but it's very different because of the history, because of the story which is there. That could also be one of the ambitions of such a project, and maybe for a second phase, is that how to bring this to a large audience. If you uh, like, like, uh, like an app which tells you the, the, the places, but also tells you stories at certain places, uh, uh, could be an interesting thing, because suddenly you can uh, visualize in, in a different way than with the antiquities uh, why such a place is, uh, is relevant of a heritage value or stands for a period in, in, in history. So thank you. I think it, you did an amazing, wonderful job and um, I will for sure download the report and maybe even use some of your ideas for our comparison case studies. I was wondering about uh, the majors because you told that all the majors took the bus and were traveling with you to Paris to present the dossier. Uh, the, political, the local political side, were they engaged at, since the beginning? Were they happy to, this, uh, to do this report? The majors in the beginning, they were hesitating a little bit because they said, if the population likes it, then I like it and I will support it. But they were very scared to support something and that become criticized by the population. So together with the mayors, we went to talk to the, to the communities. And it was always a combination of experts, people of the, uh, of the, 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 the central office of the nomination, uh, and local politicians, uh, to make a conversation. What is UNESCO about? What is our ambition? What is the story you want to share? And always, what are the consequences for you? Because if you're living in an area and you become a heritage, everybody is afraid that uh, if you want to construct something and... Uh, so we uh, uh, try to adopt a, a, a kind of rationale about this transformation thing, that this is about a landscape, and that uh, uh, the landscape is very unique, but it's at the same time always changing. So uh, in principle, the regime will not change. Many of those landscapes already had a status of, of, of some sort of a preservation, and it is enough for this thing. So as soon as people got confident that this was not a threat, but a kind of a, a benefit for them, then the mayors immediately became very enthusiastic and they all wanted to travel abroad. And they all, so once they are in the, in, in the club of the World Heritage, I mean, it's really one of the, uh, the I say, the, the, the thing on the cake uh, for, for a mayor of a small village uh, to, to be part of the World Heritage community. So, so that's their ambition. Okay, thank you very much.